Now at 10, a nation in mourning tonight after the untimely death of one of history's most prolific trailblazers for women's rights. Tonight, we remember the life and the legacy of late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and ask the question, what happens now? And Governor Gary Herbert renews his state of emergency executive order. What that means for our state, just ahead. Plus, imagine being a California firefighter forced to evacuate in order to survive while watching flames overtake your brand new home. A fire chief shares his surreal and devastating experience coming up. And good evening. It's great to have you with us on this Saturday night. I'm Nick McGurk. We do begin tonight with the big story across our country. It's the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, the Supreme Court Justice, affectionately known as the notorious RBG in her later years, died of pancreatic cancer yesterday at her home in Washington. Her life being remembered tonight, a lot of mourning going on, but a lot of folks are also looking ahead at her replacement. They're asking what happens now, and ABC4 Sarah Martin is asking the same question in studio looking back at Justice Ginsburg's life and also speaking with a University of Utah law professor about what happens next. Hi, Sarah. Nick, hello. Condolences and tributes pouring in across the country, including from our leaders here in Utah. But it's impossible not to jump forward and think about who will determine her replacement. We're just 45 days away from Election Day with a Republican president and a Republican Senate who may have the power and motivation to fast track that next nominee. My first thought was that uh, we really lost uh, a titan. Professor Kiter studies constitutional law, among other things, at the U. He says Ginsburg was a titan of gender equality, voting rights, and a lot more. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. She was nominated by Bill Clinton and appointed in 1993. In her tenure, she became a cultural icon, as well as a giant in the field for her dissents, her collars, even her workouts. Now the future of her seat is unclear. Uncharted territory at this point. Here's how a Supreme Court appointment works. The president uh, has uh, the authority under the Constitution to make uh, an appointment uh, to the court. Then the American Bar Association and the Senate Judiciary Committee do an extensive background check that usually takes about two months. If that appointee passes the Judiciary Committee, the appointee goes to the full Senate for a vote. The Senate uh, recently uh, uh, eliminated the filibuster uh, for Supreme Court nominees and as a result a majority vote will carry the day for confirmation of uh, a Supreme Court appointee. In the current Senate that means three Republicans will have to vote no to stop an appointee. There's a little question that uh, the nomination process uh, is going to be controversial uh, this time. If a new president is elected in November the current Senate will still be in session until the end of the year. The Senate could continue to consider the nomination. Well, remember just four years ago, the Republican Senate under President Obama refused to consider a Supreme Court appointee 10 months before the election, Mitch McConnell claiming then the American people should have a voice through the election of the next president. Nick? Well, obviously, Senator Mitt Romney is going to be a huge voice in all this. What are we hearing from him and Senator Lee? Obviously, Romney sometimes can be off of the main Right. current of the Republican Party, so to speak. Definitely. It's really just too soon to know exactly how Mitt Romney and Mike Lee will play into all of this. Both of them have released a statement of condolences for the justice, but neither have made a statement on whether or not they'd be willing to move forward and vote on another Trump nominee. So we know Mike Lee has traditionally made decisions in line with the Trump administration, voting to confirm Brett Kavanaugh in that very controversial appointment process in 2018. Romney, though, does generally not fall in line with the administration. Remember, he was the only Republican to vote to convict Donald Trump during the impeachment vote just back in February. Again, three senators would have to break from the Republican Party to block another Trump nominee. Definitely interesting. It's going to be a lot of news coming up. A lot of news in this 2020 election certainly was crazy, and it just got a lot crazier. Thank you, Sarah Martin, for that report, and obviously a tragic day for the country. Okay, moving on now. A live look tonight at our massive colonial flag sitting at half-staff in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Today, Governor Gary Herbert ordering the lowering of the U.S. flag in honor of the late justice's life. Now, the flag will fly at half-staff until her internment. Let's talk now. Less than 24 hours after news of her death broke, the battle over who will fill Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat, yeah, it's going to be a very contentious battle. Now, here's what we know. It's a hot-button issue among lawmakers in Washington. ABC's Rachel Scott fills us in with the rest. Almost immediately following the news of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, 
The battle over who will fill her seat on the Supreme Court began in Washington. Totally President Trump addressing that. the issue as he left for a campaign rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And we have an obligation as the winners to pick who we want. Uh, that's not the next president. Hopefully I'll be the next president. We have an obligation to the voters, all of the people, the millions of people that put us here. Sources tell ABC News President Trump has a short list of potential nominees. And before making any announcement, he is expected to speak with each of them. I would say that a woman would be in first place. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell issuing a statement Friday night saying President Trump's nominee will receive a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. And a reversal from his position in 2016. Obama. When he the refused Senate to consider continue. Mayor Garland, President Obama's nominee to the high court after Justice Antonin Scalia died that February. This vacancy should not be filled uh, by this lame duck president. Joe Biden clear. calling on Republicans That's to be consistent. Voters should pick the president and the president should pick the justice. But McConnell well, says really this is a different situation, with Republicans controlling both the White House and Senate. But at least one of those Republicans, Senator Lisa Murkowski, said Friday, before the news of Ginsburg's death, that she would not vote to confirm a Supreme Court nominee right now. And Maine's Republican Senator Susan Collins, who was locked in a tight race, telling the New York Times recently she would not vote on a nominee in October, saying it's too close to the election. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Washington. So much more to come on that. New tonight, the FBI and Secret Service are investigating an envelope sent to the White House that federal officials say was laced with ricin. Now, the package was intercepted and screened at a government facility. We're told the package tested positive for ricin. That's a deadly toxin found in castor beans. Federal investigators currently working to determine just where the envelope originated from, who mailed it. Of course, the FBI, the Secret Service, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, they are all working in tandem to lead this investigation. Today, the second in a row that Utah has surpassed 1,000 new COVID cases. The Department of Health reporting 1,077 cases since yesterday. Governor Gary Herbert calling our recent growth alarming. Here's the health department said. Three new deaths since yesterday as well. Brings our state's death total now to 440. In total, 62,000. 852 Utahns have tested positive for COVID since this pandemic began. Now, a rolling average over the last week, 796 positive tests per day. Our seven-day average for positive test results is 12.7%. And Governor Gary Herbert placing Utah under a state of emergency over our recent spike in cases. Now, the previous executive order had been scheduled to expire today. Now, in practice, it won't look any different for our residents here in Utah. It goes for next month. And that's at that point, the governor can issue another executive order or decide to let that state of emergency expire. Well, new tonight, Tippinogas High School in Orem, they will transition to a hybrid schedule this week. And this is coming among a record-breaking week, cases skyrocketing across our state. Right now, the school says it will be closed this Monday, September 21st. That's to allow teachers time to plan and transition to a hybrid curriculum. You talk to teachers. And that's not nothing. It's a very difficult and time consuming process. The school says it plans to reevaluate case counts at the end of the month to determine what measures they are going to move forward with. For more information on the program, you can head to our website, abc4.com. Happening now, an 11 year old is being sought. South Salt Lake police are asking for the public's health to find a missing and endangered 11 year old boy. Caden Christensen was last seen just before noon today wearing a black sweatshirt and blue jeans. Caden is 4 foot 9. 80 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. So if you've seen Caden, you're urged to please call police. Meteorologist Adam Carroll joining us now. Adam, the times are changing. It's getting a little chilly out there. Well, you know, we are only just three days away from astronomical fall, so the time should be changing. And one thing that we saw today was not only cooler temperatures, but we saw some much needed rainfall. Our front came through here about eh, 12, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock here throughout much of northern Utah. You saw that rain kind of move through into southwestern Wyoming, into eastern portions of our state. But all of southern Utah, really didn't see much of anything and they're just getting uh, at least they're just seeing those temperatures starting to cool as that front passes on by but near half an inch in Menden believe it or not that thanks to a, a different storm that moved through earlier this afternoon 0.4 Plymouth 0.33 Eden 0.32 Lewiston most of northern Utah saw 0.3 to a half an inch of rain quarter of an inch in Logan 
Oh, but the airport only saw five one hundredths of an inch, unfortunately. However, this is what it looked like here from the beginning of the day onward. Now, we saw a lot of smoke here to start our day. We smelled it outside. Uh, and then that front came through, saw a little bit of shower activity, as we, as we mentioned. But we also saw clearing skies to a actually nice, if you want to say, evening. But we still see the hazy smoke out there because there's our smoke right there covering a large portion of our western half of our state. Our front is strung across the eastern half of the state, continuing to move on by. Now, that does hinder our air quality a little bit. We have yellow air quality for most areas here of northern Utah, except for cash, except for carbon. But we even have them down south into uh, Iron and Washington counties. How is that going to look tomorrow? And is that smoke coming back, even though we've cleared out a little bit? All well, coming up. All right, Adam, thanks very much. Now to an update on a story we brought you is breaking news last night. Police in Midvale say they've ID'd the man shot and killed during an altercation with police. Again, this happening last night. Police say 22-year-old Matthew Nolden was the passenger in a car that was being pursued by police. The driver, Joseph Soltz, was a wanted fugitive. Now, Schultz eventually stopped the car and took off on foot, according to police. Nolden also got out of the car, which police say is when he opened fire. Police then shot back, hitting and killing that 22-year-old. The shooting, obviously, still currently under investigation. In national news, two people are dead and 14 others hurt after a shooting at a party in Rochester, New York. Now, victims ranged in age from 17 years old to 23 years old, including the two who died. Now, the other 14 victims were taken to the hospital, and they are expected to survive. Coming up, wildfires burning through California displaced thousands leaving one firefighter dead, the high-profile person whose new home burned to the ground, and the latest on those fires after the break. Plus, looking live outside, you can see our weather ball. It is blue. We'll have another cool day tomorrow. Not much of a breeze out there now, but we do have fall on the way. What's that look like? Coming up in your full forecast. Welcome back. 
Crews continue to search for a hiker tonight who hasn't been seen in nearly a week. Now, crews searched the High Uintas today. It is the last place Kyle Wimpenny, a 25 year old from Boise, had reportedly been. Now, officials say he never returned from his backpacking trip up to Kings Peak. Now, it was just two days ago that officials found Wimpenny's vehicle at the Henry's Fork Trailhead. He may be hiking with a blue backpack. The sheriff's office tweeting tonight the search for him begins again tomorrow morning. A sad day for the North Summit Fire District as they paid respects to one of their own. Firefighter Alan Powell fell from a 14 foot cherry picker last month. Now, the tragic accident sent Powell to the ICU. He had a broken pelvis, fractured bones along his spine, fractured ribs. On Monday, his wife posted to his GoFundMe page that Powell had died from what was likely a blood clot. In California, dozens are without their homes tonight after strong winds pushed a wildfire, burning for nearly two weeks in mountains northeast of LA onto the desert floor. Just another headline in this massive fire season for California. This comes just days after officials announced the death of a firefighter battling the El Dorado fire. That's near San Bernardino. One of the families to lose their homes was that of Fire Chief Lythan Dryden with Cal Fire. His family had just moved into their brand new home 17 days earlier. For the last 15 years, I've been in the fire service, and you know it's it's hard to be able to watch your own home burn, let alone other people's homes burn in their possessions. But it really hits home when it's your own house. Dryden says he hopes he and his parents can rebuild their homes. He's unsure of when they could start the process. Believes it could take a very long time. Obviously, life important, but. Getting structures saved, also very important, very tough to see that. Okay, closer to home, there are currently eight large wildfires burning here in Utah. The East Fork Fire in the High Uintas now sits at more than 60,000 acres in size. That fire currently the largest in our state, jumped by more than 10,000 acres in just the last day. Now, the fire is currently 24% contained. According to mapping data, the Finney Lake Fire and the East Fork Fire merged to form a wildfire complex. Crews say despite the dip in temperatures and increased humidity, winds have picked up. The fire is being fueled by dense and dry vegetation, so no surprise there. The Center Creek Trail Fire, also burning in the High Uintas in Duchesne County, it is situated within the East Fork Fire Closure Area. Now, this is because the two fires, they are burning in close proximity to each other. It was a lightning caused blaze that ignited back on August 25th, sits at about 1,200 acres in size, continues to see moderate growth while remaining. Uncontained. Finally, the William Fire continues to burn tonight. That is in Utah County. The fire ignited back on September 6th as a result of target shooting. It's grown about 200 acres in the last 24 hours to 5,790 acres. Now, crews, well, they say they've also increased containment by almost 20%. Now it sits at 62% containment. Time now for Utah's most accurate forecast with Adam Carroll, weather rate certified nine years in a row. Okay, Adam, it's a little cooler outside, but just as we mentioned, there's some dry vegetation out there, so fire danger is still a real thing, right? Oh, well, it'll continue to be. We need rain. We did see some here, as we saw in our first forecast of where we did see the rain, but it didn't get much past Salt Lake City, unfortunately, so that's not going to do a whole lot to help us with our dry vegetation. And because we've been so dry, it's actually leading to an earlier uh, color change in terms of our trees out there. But they are beautiful right now. Up in the Wasatch back, the Wasatch Mountain State Park area of Midway shows lots of color here mixed in with the Gulf and even some smoke in our background as well, unfortunately, for those fires. But you know, looking at our fall foliage update, you know, right now the Uintas, portions of our eastern mountains like the Tavaputs and the Book Cliffs, we're seeing uh, we're partial to near peak right now, and this is typical for this time of year for this area of the state. While we'll continue to get closer and closer to peak here for our valleys as we head into October, but high temperatures. 79. Now, earlier earlier this morning, we get 81, but looks like they're going to record 79 as the high temperature today at the airport. 69 in Logan, 63 Evanston, 97 in St. George. Now, temperatures outside. We're going to head for a chilly night tonight. It's 59 in Salt Lake. It's nice and comfy. 77 in Hanksville and Green River, 83 in St. George, and 54 in Elko. But look at our temperature change. My goodness, we're seeing a lot changes of our temperatures here in the northern portions of our state. Well, that's where we've 
we've seen the cold front. Now, we'll have a seasonably, tight, uh, in terms of our temperatures, type of day tomorrow. As showers remain to our north, warmer temperatures to our east. More smokes in the offing, though, unfortunately. Even though we saw a little relief today, it's going to be thick at times, but not as thick as we saw earlier. We'll have the haze. We'll have the air quality issue, but mainly moderate. As you can see here, air quality is showing moderate here for all of the areas that do monitor air quality. So keep that in mind. Future cast heading into that Monday time frame, since we've talked about Sunday, shows some clouds later in the day kind of starting to billow up, and we might actually have some showers across the high terrain, especially uh, of central and no southern Utah, also east of I-15. But we have better chances towards the end of next weekend. Now, 77 in Salt Lake, and then we'll go 81 in Elko, 97 in St. George, and we'll have another hazy day out there. But this is hazy throughout the state because we'll have more in the way of, um, unfortunately, that smoke and haze out there. And then we'll stay pretty much in the mid to upper 90s here for the next seven days, but it will get very windy here by the end of next week, and of course that does heighten our fire danger. Now fall astronomically begins on Tuesday morning. We might have an isolated shower in the area on Tuesday, but overall it's going to be mainly in the 80s here. Very, very nice and gets very windy end of next week into the weekend. We may have a nice big storm coming in for Sunday. I was just thinking about what my kids are going to wear for Halloween. Have you been thinking about that? Yeah, it's still a ways out there, Nick. Hey, fall's in the air. I can feel it, <laughs> sir. All right, uh, NBA basketball in the air. Yeah, a lot going on today. Besides the NBA, we also have the Stanley Cup Finals, the U.S. Open Golf Tournament, and Real Salt Lake back on the home pitch trying to pick up a win against the Whitecaps. We've got highlights and reaction when we come back to sports.
Time now for ABC4 News Sports with Wesley Ruff. Real Salt Lake had an up and down week last week, shutting out LAFC, then getting shut out by Colorado. Well, after a week off, we wondered which team would show up tonight. RSL at home taking on Vancouver. Less than 5,000 fans allowed in. RSL dominating play in the first half. They could not find the net, however. Multiple chances for Real. But they were either stopped by the keeper or sailed high. A couple going over the net in this one. RSL with opportunities, but the first half ended in a scoreless draw. Boom. In the second half, Vancouver got on the board. Nice pass, and the shot gets under Patna. That goal made it 1-0 Vancouver. Then Beckerman gets a red card. RSL playing a man down, but they get the equalizer. Justin Miram with the header. That ties the game up at 1 with a man down. But Vancouver comes back 84th minute. The pass in front. Cavallini gets a foot on it. Finds the back of the net. 2-1 is your final. RSL had some chances but could not score. They lose 2-1, and that is a very costly loss for RSL. Guys fought their heart, heart out. It was... Uh... We went after it. We put everything we could in there. Unfortunately, you know, that we put ourselves in that situation. The guys fought, and they responded to that, and we created some, some good chances and just couldn't, couldn't get the second goal. You know, you go down a man, uh, and then we, uh, you know, we dig deep as a team, as we've done and as we've shown this year, um, to, to get an equalizer. Uh, just unfortunately, we couldn't, um, you know, uh, get, a, get a result out of this game. Well, the U.S. Open Golf Championship usually ends up being a battle of attrition, and the course ends up being the winner. That certainly is true at Wingfoot. The course, very difficult, and the scores reflect that. Tony Finau got his day off to a good start after a par at number one. He rolled in this birdie putt on number two. He was moving up the leaderboard. He added another birdie here on number 10. He just touched this putt, and it rolled and rolled. But he had bogeys on four of his last eight holes. He is tied for 21st. Matthew Wolf bidding to become the first American golfer since Francis we met to, in 1913 to win the Open in his first attempt. Great shot out of the bunker. He had a great round today. Bryson DeChambeau still hanging around. This putt circles the hole and then drops. He's three under in second place, but it's Wolf with the lead. He shot a 65 today, five under par through three rounds. He has a two shot lead heading into tomorrow's final round. In the NBA playoffs, the Miami Heat trying to open up a 3-0 lead on the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. Gordon Hayward back in the lineup for the Celtics, back from an ankle injury, and he was doing his thing. Great pass from Hayward. Leads to the dunk. Boston opened up a double-digit lead. And then another former Jazz player, Jay Crowder, with a steal for Miami, up ahead to Tyler Hero. He hits the three in transition. Jalen Brown blocks Drogic. Tatum takes the ball the other way, pushes Crowder out of the way, and dunks this one with authority. Boston was out in front most of this game. The Celtics had four players scoring over 20 points, and the Celtics wanted to win game three, 117 to 106. But the Heat still lead that series two games to one. Hockey in September. Game one of the Stanley Cup Finals, Dallas and Tampa Bay. The Stars scoring first. Hines gets the loose puck, finds Hanley out front. He fires it in. The Lightning would tie it up, though. Blake Coleman takes a shot from the point. The original shot is saved. But somehow finds its way into the net. And then it was all Dallas after that. Olesiak has a shot saved, but he gets his own rebound and puts it in. They get another goal later. Dallas goes on to win game one by a score of 4-1. to one. That's your final. The Stars take a 1-0 lead in this best of seven series. And at the Tour de France, the penultimate stage, time trial. Roglic had a 57-second lead with just one stage to go, but his countryman, Pogacar, stunned the Tour de France by winning the stage, taking the yellow jersey. He beat Roglic by 1 minute and 56 seconds. It's totally unheard of. Never that, seen that happen before. What a comeback. That sounds like a big deal, Wes. Final round. They'll just ride into Paris tomorrow, but it looks like uh, he's going to win it. Roglic had that lead and couldn't hold on. Okay. Well, I remember the Lance Armstrong era, but yeah. can't say that I was following it this year. So... Thank you. You betcha. We'll be right back after the break.
Ahoy, matey. Halloween is just over a, well, just over a month away. Adam Carroll, I hope you're listening. <laughs> and just in time for early celebrations and costume preparations, Adam, I hope you're listening. It's National Talk Like a Pirate Day. So today's the day to celebrate, Adam. Whether you deck out your house to look like a pirate ship or you get an eye patch, it will arguably be a fun time. Is that pretty bad? Oof, it's brutal. It was, uh, it's in, we need another pun here, but uh, uh, I'm struggling. Just talk about the weather, would you? Well, you know what? We're going to have some hazy skies here throughout much of the region yet again tomorrow. Maybe not as thick, at least during the first part of the day. We might actually start seeing a little bit more dense smoke come in later, latter half of the day, but 77 for the daytime high. That is right about average this time of year in Salt Lake City and 97 in St. George. A little breezy in the afternoon. Uh, but overall, it looks to be a pretty nice near end of summer day. Right, 77 degrees. Not a lot to complain about there, but the hazy skies, certainly worth noting. Thank you for watching tonight. We'll see you tomorrow at 5.